Okay, so next uh, is on buoy. So on, you can take us through your presentation. Um, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Uh, a lot of Thomas um, points have uh, are in my presentation, so I hope you will still <laughs> enjoy my presentation. Okay, everyone, um, today I will be talking about a potential technology in the future called mine uploading and some ethical considerations that come with it. Um, but first, I just want to give you a brief reminder of technological singularity and transhumanism. According to Moore's law, computing power doubles approximately every two years. At one point, this technological um, sing uh, growth will be incomprehensible and irreversible, resulting in a drastic change in the human civilization. As you can see on the graph at the top right, where you can see at the point of the singularity, we will have transhumans. So according to transhumanists, the human species in their current form are not, the, are not at the end of their development, but the, rather at the beginning. In the future with singularity, we will be able to transcend biology by eliminating aging and improving human intellectual, physical, and psychological capacity with our most groundbreaking human enhancement medicine. Disease, pain, and suffering will be things of the past. However, such a great technology will bring along many ethical issues that we haven't seen before. Here is the brief overview of what I will be talking about today. We will go through these one by one. First, I will answer the question of what is mind uploading? I will propose some benefits of mind uploading some existential risk and social perils of mine uploading, and I will suggest some moral justification of mine uploading and some few uh, ethical consideration. After that, we will talk about how we could best prepare ourselves for the arrival of mine uploading by rethinking our human technology relationships. So for the ethics section, which is the main part of my presentation, I will address these following questions. How, why should this technology be developed and allowed? How will the risk associated with it be mitigated? How can mine uploading be made safe for everyone? Who should get access to mine uploading? And how should people with uploaded mines be ethically treated? But first, let's talk about mine, what mine uploading is. Mine uploading is not a new topic. It has been the subject of many science fiction movies, films, books, and TV series. In those works, mine uploading is always described as some evil technology that will eventually betray humans. For example, in Robin Hansen, The Age of M novel, he talked about a future in which researchers have learned to copy the human mind to a computer. They then run this program to create M's or emulated people. M's eventually outnumber humans and dominate the earth. Even though this scenario is fascinating, I do not agree with their definition and interpretation of mind uploading. If such a groundbreaking technology allows humans to recreate minds in a digital form, it seems irrational to make copies of human that will thrive while the original copy dies. After all, no one could guarantee if such a copy would behave the same way the original person does or would uphold the same moral beliefs. On the other hand, this act of cloning and creating multiple instances of self, in my opinion, diminishes the value of individuality, um, self-identity, and uniqueness of mind by reducing AI to a copy of an existing human with no original thoughts and little agency we establish the exact opposite of what our technology is heading and aiming to achieve. So I will propose my definition of mind uploading. 
It is relocating the mind, a collection of memories, personality, and characteristic of one individual from their original organic brain to an artificial computational substrate, leaving absolutely nothing behind. This removes the need for an independence on the vulnerable biological bodies. Mind uploading will give birth to a new generations of human 2.0, whose bodies are entirely made of machines and artificial materials. Incoming information will be processed and analyzed within the new brain, which contain every component of the latest computer model, including a processor and a hard drive. Through private Network connections, these brains will be directly linked to the internet and their corresponding personal cloud storage, where thoughts, emotions, memories are stored, encrypted, and safeguarded by the most up to date cybersecurity service. New thoughts and feelings after being generated offline could be uploaded to the cloud storage, and memories could be downloaded to the brain. This large scale society of uploads and downloads will revolutionize human civilization. Communication will be done mostly through the internet where people will share their thoughts and emotions even before they speak. Humans 2.0 will no longer survive on food and water, but rather on electric city generated from renewable sources such as solar and wind energy. The definitions of reproduction and death, therefore, will also need to change. We know that researchers and physicians have been able to 3D print organs to be used in transplant. Researchers have also taken steps to create robots that self-replicate using 3D printing, suggesting that this might be the new form of reproduction for those who engage in mind uploading. As mind uploading will transform the nature of the human race, we also ought to redefine the concept of death. It will be regarded solely as brain death, in which the new brain fails to generate new information or loses its processing capacity. Brain death also happens when the old brain, that is the biological brain, is severely damaged prior to mind uploading. Individuals could also voluntarily choose to terminate their digital brain activity. For mind uploading to be possible, we have to accept three technical assumptions, physicalism, scannability, and computability. Physicalism holds that everything about the mind is contained within the physical brain and follows law of nature. Connections between neurons in a brain are called connectomes, and many scientists believe that these connectomes hold the information of what makes us who we are. The second assumption of scannability entails that one day, humans will be able to scan these connectomes, map their activity, and reconstruct the brain's neural network to digitize the human mind. Lastly, mind uploading assumes that the mind is a computational system and its core mental processes, like reasoning, decision making, and problem solving, work in a similar fashion to a Turing machine. The question of whether mind uploading could be done remains controversial. Randall Kern, a neuroscientist who worked as a research professor at Boston University Center for Memory and Brain, he said that. All of the evidence seems to say that in theory, mind uploading is possible. It is extremely difficult, but it's possible. So then you could say that it is visionary, but not mad, because that implies that you're thinking of something that's just impossible, and that's not the case. To correctly recreate the mind, we have to map out billions of individual molecules that produce behaviors at cellular level. Mapping a single molecule alone to the highest level of detail produces 3.14 times 10 to the 14 terabytes of data. Scanning a single mind, 
that is made of 86 billion neurons will generate more data than the capacity of all data storage on Earth. Some scientists also argue that there is no way the human consciousness can be reduced to a software program running on a robot, however smart or sophisticated. However, the current technology doesn't have enough data to tell us for sure if it is possible or not. Moving on to the benefits of mind uploading, I think we can all agree that mind uploading will grant us a utopia of immortality. Some enthusiasts believe that mind uploading would be better than cryonics in preserving the culture of human species. By separating bodily functions from the biological body, we completely abolish cellular aging, cognitive decline, and chronic diseases such as cancer. Physical accidents that, for example, might paralyze biological bodies will not harm the body as humans 2.0. Mind uploading will also significantly improve the quality of life. The ability to offload memories and existing knowledge to the cloud storage will lead to a significant increase in the cognitive processing speed. This will result in a generation of highly proficient and intelligent workers. Many mental health problems such as anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorders might be solved by the ability to lock away certain thoughts emotions, and memories. Also, since healthcare resources will no longer be focused on treating diseases, they will be used to create better human enhancement technology. A similar functionality has already uh, been under development at Neuralink Corporation, a brain computer interface and neuroprosthetics company started by Elon Musk in 2016. Neuralink is developing ultra-high bandwidth brain-machine interfaces to connect humans and computer. These devices restore motor and sensory function in neurological diseases and brain damages, such as stroke and spinal cord injury. In the future, the company aims to develop other technologies for human enhancement. Mind uploading will be the solution to our population and environmental problem. The new mechanical body will allow humans to travel to the most dangerous places on Earth without the risk of radiation, oxygen shortage, high pressure, etc. Uh, mind uploading will facilitate interstellar travel, providing a way for humanity to escape a potential global catastrophe and to relieve the burden on Earth's natural resources. This technology is being developed by NASA, NASA and DARPA. Their 100-year Starship Initiative proposes to send people to the star by the year 2100. Currently, to reach the nearest star, you will have to travel at 35.7 million um, miles per hour this extremely high speed endangers the survival and safety of astronauts on board. The solution to this problem is to abandon the biological bodies and to create e-crews, the emulation of astronauts' mind in solid state electronic circuitry. E-crews will not require air, water, food, medical care, or radiation shielding, and they will be able to withstand extreme acceleration. So there are some existential risk and social perils to mind uploading. First, what would be the purposes of human then if we have an internal life? And if we have um, an internal life, what would be the meaning of it? How can a being made entirely of metal without a heart and a brain be referred to as human? And if mind uploading is possible and we move towards human engineering, such as 3D printing as mean of reproducing, then how can we ensure that these humans 2.0 are truly humans? To answer to these questions, I will turn to the post-phenomenology philosophy. 
post phenomenology is a philosophy of technology that emphasizes the role of technology in transforming the human experiences. Post phenomenology proposes four ways technologies play a role in human world relation, ranging from being embodied and being read to being interacted with and being in the background. In embodiment relations, technology form a unity with human, which is so essential that the world becomes strange without them. Examples of this relation include eyeglasses or pacemaker. Hermeneutic relations are relations in which technology changes our interpretation of the world, such as a thermometer or MRI. In authority relation, human beings interact with technologies, with the world at the background, such as ATM and iPhones. The last relation is background, in which technologies are the mere context for human experiences and actions. Moving forward, I believe mind uploading will likely have the embodiment and hermeneutic relations with human. This means that mind uploading will not be external to our being, but rather what makes us human. It will be integral to our perception of the world and our interaction with it. Furthermore, the definition of life and human nature are not static. In creating and reforming technology, we are also redefining the kinds of humans we are and will become. As evidenced by the long history of organ transplantation, we constantly redefine what it is to be human, what is the values of life. And making life internal is not going to make us less human. When all personal information will be available online, individuality, self-identity, and privacy will be at risk. Individuality is an important part of maintaining one's identity. With others' information readily available online, a person may be less inclined to create and develop their sense of individuality, since it can be easier to just steal from someone else. A strong and prosperous society needs and cherishes um, individuality diverse and creative points of view push for innovation and new invention. Therefore, people who lack a firm sense of individuality will soon become a burden to society. On the other hand, knowledge, feelings, and thoughts of a person can be stolen from their brain in their personal cloud storage. These leave the person vulnerable to brain harvester who can steal their identity and use their information for vile purposes. This means that mind uploading has the potential to democratize the next generation of evil. This powerful technology, when in hands of extreme individual, could inflict unimaginable damages on others. So to solve that problem, um, cybersecurity and legal systems surrounding identity theft and organ trafficking need a significant revision or a complete reform. It is important that we improve cybersecurity to foster self-identity and intellectual properties. We also need to enforce harsh penalties for the abuse of mind uploading. Another risk of mind uploading will come from transferring a criminal's mind, as I will discuss next. Everyone should have an equal right to mind uploading. However, if the criminal faces a death sentence, their digital mind will be terminated. Nevertheless, their existing information in the cloud storage should be preserved for analysis. This allows investigators to gain unique insights into the criminal psyche to generate patterns for crime and to create a crime-free society. There are three major moral questions that need to be addressed uh, when moving forward with mind uploading. First is how is mind uploading ethically justified? 
Second is who should have access to mine uploading. And third is how should humans 2.0 be ethically treated? Um, I will attempt to uh, answer those questions with two possible application of ethic, top down and bottom up. We can look at mine uploading from a consequentialist perspective. A consequentialist perspective um, views the outcome of a given action as the ultimate moral determinant about its rightness and wrongness. An example of this is utilitarianism. Utilitarianism favors actions that maximize the utility, which is often defined in terms of happiness and well being. This also means that they prefer minimizing misery. Mind uploading, therefore, is highly favorable and should be implemented as it eliminates all sufferings that come from diseases, illnesses, and aging. At the same time, it maximizes the collective benefits of creating a very efficient society. Another top-down approach to mind uploading is the ontological perspective. It is obligation, duty, and rule-based ethic, which could be used to assess mind uploading as right or wrong based on how it conforms to normative standards. Below are some ethical principles that favor the implementation of mind uploading and justify how it should be made accessible to everyone. So the first principle I want to talk about is capability and well-being theories of justice. Capability theory states that the qualities of a person's life depends on what they are capable of, um, such as life and bodily health. A just society should then provide the person with these capabilities. The well-being theory also recognizes that a just society is built on ensuring individuals can experience well-being. With mind uploading, we'll, we will be able to assure that everyone has a decent and fulfilling life. To decide who should get access to mind uploading, I will turn to egalitarianism and libertarianism. Uh, from an egalitarianism perspective, it is important that a technology being so important to humans should be distributed equally to everyone if they desire to regardless of their financial condition, socioeconomic status, race, and ethnicity. If mind uploading becomes the new norm of medicine, then it is crucial to provide every society member with the choice to engage in mind uploading. A libertarian values personal freedom, autonomy, liberty, and free association, which all point towards making mind uploading available to everyone who chooses to pursue it. Services like mind uploading should be treated like any other routine medical procedures, such as plastic surgeries. The questions of how we should treat humans 2.0 morally lies at the core of the debate about their moral standings. Other than a new body, humans 2.0 have every moral property of a traditional human, including sentience, cognitive properties, moral agency, and relationship, which all give them a moral status. Because of their moral status, humans 2.0 deserve to be treated with the same moral rights as with traditional human. So to answer this question better, I will turn to a bottom-up approach. In June 2014, the Supreme Court of the United States finalized its decision in Riley v. California case, in which the justices ruled that police officer may not search a cell phone's content without a warrant after an arrest. Chief Justice John Roberts declared that modern cell phones are now such a pervasive and insistent part of daily life that a proverbial visitors from Mars might conclude that they were an important feature of human anatomy. 
This is the first time the Supreme Court explicitly considered cyborgs in, or augmented humans in the case law, even if it was a kind of metaphor. This case marks the beginning of understanding and developing laws for augmented humans. The person you see on the left is Neil Harbison. He is a cyborg artist and an activist for trans species right. He is the first person in the world with an antenna implanted in his skull and for being legally recognized as a cyborg by government. His antenna sends audible vibrations through his skull to report information to him. His Wi-Fi antenna also allows him to receive signals and data from satellites. As an activist, he proposes some legal rights for the future cyborgs that I adopted for this presentation. The first right is freedom from disassembly. Humans 2.0 should have their bodily integrity protected and they should be free from unnecessary search, seizure, suspension, or interruption of function and dismantling without a fair cost. This includes their uploaded mind and other intellectual properties. The second right for humans 2.0 is freedom of morphology. This means that they shall be free to engage in any permanent adaptation alteration, modification, or augmentations of their body. They shall be free from coerced or other involuntary, involuntary morphological changes. The third part, which I think is the most important part, is equality. Humans 2.0 should have absolutely the same equal rights as traditional human they shall receive all rights, benefits, and responsibilities extended to natural persons. Um, this includes, but are not limited to rights to liberty, political participation, rights to um, social, economic, and cultural equality. The last one is right to bodily sovereignty. Humans 2.0 are entitled to a complete dominion over their bodies and intelligence. So these cases give us some answer of how humans 2.0 should be ethically treated in the future. Mind uploading will create a psychological benchmark for determining, for determining what is a human. Reformation to the legal and ethics system to provide safety for traditional humans and humans 2.0 are necessary but insufficient to prepare for the arrival of mind uploading. How we perceive interactions between human and non-human intelligence will also need to change. This is because our knowledge of right or wrong or what we call our moral consciousness is structured by an intersubjective intentionality. That means in order to make conscious acts you must consider, acknowledge, and respond to other beings in our world. The notion that technologies serve us and stay in the background and humans are superior to other non-human beings is outdated and problematic. Holding on to this notion will prevent us from making ethical decisions in the future with, the, with regard to mind uploading. So, I suggest that in the future, we should adopt the concept of the actor network theory to rethink the human technology relationships. In this theory, humans and technologies are bound up together in networks of socio-technical collectives and they work together. Technology is an actor that is capable of agency, their role of being a bystander, a slave in a sense, is strongly disregarded. So to prepare for the future, I want to once again uh, say that the idea of enhancing our bodies is not new, but the extent to which transhumanists take the concept is. 
We have such a long history of human augmentation from making wooden leg and hearing aids and teeth dentures. In the future, as possible as we can connect ourselves to memory chips or an antenna, we will be able to use mind uploading to transfer every human biological components to computer machines. By merging man and machine, science will produce humans with vastly increased intelligence, strength, and lifespan, as jobs that require physical actions will be replaced by AI in the future. Our con contributions to the world will mainly be done through the mind. So with the singularity approaching soon, mind uploading will be inevitable as it is the only way humans can retain their role in this world. The terror over robot domination and AI control is rooted in our history of conquest and exploitation than in the actual threat of AIs. While AI can still pose an existential danger to human, if they are well developed, they will benefit humanity immensely. Conversation around mind uploading should help us reflect on what it is to be human and what it could be rather than reinforcing any conservative ideas of the human nature. To harness the power of mind uploading, we need to construct new norms, ethical standards, and legal system. Mind uploading will bring the legal challenges of forecasting, preventing, and mitigating malicious use of technology. That means better cybersecurity needs to be in place. What seems undeniable to me, though, is that humans 2.0 must hold the same rights as traditional humans. Therefore, I call for a radical dehumanization, which is the unlearning of human prejudices and ways of living. The fear that technologies will be dehumanizing are legitimate but misplaced. What is important? Important that we is that we must move away from worrying that humanity will be replaced and ruled by an artificial superintelligence, so that we can prosper with mind unloading in the future. Um, thank you for listening. That is the end of my presentation. Um, I will just take questions. Yeah, I think if you unshare, it makes it easier. There we go. Okay. Any questions? I have a question and I'm not sure if it's just because I'm not quite understanding. I mean, none of us really understand how a brain scan will actually look like and what implications it will have until the technology is made. Um, but I was wondering about how procreation, um, procreation would look like, right? Like would, <laughs> Would we be able to have children in the digital universe, you know? Um, yeah, so so in, in the ethics part, I mentioned um, that I will use libertarianism to, um, I guess, regulate mind uploading. That is, anyone who wants to do it can do it. Um, but when they do it, they should know that by transferring everything to a machine, and abandoning their biological bodies, they will not be able to um, perform like conventional reproduction methods. So um, uh, when, when I think of mind uploading, I think that in the future, not everyone will be machines. There will be people who choose to stay in their biological bodies and that is totally fine. They can still um, reproducing in, um, in, in, in a, regular manner, um, but people who choose to uh, engage in mind uploading should start thinking about like 3D printing uh, as a mean to um, reproduce. Mm -hmm. um, along the same lines, do you see any ethical implications for age, right? Should there be a certain age after which people are allowed to upload their brain scans? Um, at first, I thought um, I thought people who are over 65 
should be able to um, should should be the only people who get mind uploading. Um, but but then I I can't disregard that thinking because that would be discriminating like young people and and because um, aging technically um, starts when you are like 18 or 16 or 19. Um, so I think that allowing people who are over 18 to make their own decision would be the best because then we wouldn't violate as many um, ethical ethics. The, Thank you. The question of whether you would enjoy the process or enjoy being an upload is complicated by the prediction that you would be able to choose your mood and it would include all sorts of moods and feelings that you're not currently able to have because you're sort of li limited in what you can influence and what you can feel. So there is also likely to be a lot of pressure in society for people to obtain evidence that people who do mind uploading are happy, right? <laughs> and, and it works out, right? But how would you know? Because the, 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 the pressure for the first mind upload to report back that it's just great, you know, that they're enjoying every moment would be tremendous. And if they could dial that dial of feelings to whatever they wanted, how would you be able to trust the answer? So, and isn't that then a big question for you? How do you determine the success of this? How do you determine? I mean, it one is how widely adopted it is, but you could imagine a horrifying scenario where actually it's 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 completely terrible to be a mind upload, but everybody does it anyway, right? So the you know embrace of it, the, the number of people doing it is very high, but the outcome's terrible. But no nobody is able to truthfully tell you that they don't don't enjoy it so how how would you determine whether it's successful or not um i think that is a very um difficult question because even even now even when we are in our biological bodies when we take these like psycholo uh, psych psychology tests there there is still bias and it, the result vary depending on our mood on that day or uh, what we see on the roads when we came to the test center. Um, yes, so when I think of mind uploading and testing the outcomes of it, I would imagine uh, when we take the participant in the room, we would somehow have to ask them to turn off their mood changer if that was um, um, functionality in um, in them uploaded mine so they they should turn off any like mood changer or any controller so that we can set like a baseline on how they should feel and then we we conduct a test like a very regular um, psychology test uh, at least I I would imagine it would become like that easy um, but it's the future so um, the best we could do is just to predict and hope for the best so what would personal appearance be? Would it be like what the, the ceramic slab that you ended up ha being on looks like? Might just be shiny and, and black, right? Or um, would it be the, the, the sort of representation of you? Maybe you, you would have like a profile icon or something, right? So what, what, what would be the essence of personal appearance? Um, so so for, for me, I think that um, in the future, humans can have like the physical appearance and also they will have an appearance um, in their like 
network in their uh, the network where their uploaded mines are. Um, for the physical uh, appearance, we already know that um, scientists have already been able to create like dolls and robots that look very similar uh, similar to human. They have like silicon skin and it looks very um, texture, um, very like skin like. Um, so I, I think that in the future we will we will have that as our physical appearance that that is we have like silicon skin and um, our organs and um, the internal of our body is just um, machines and computers. And for the um, digital network, um, I think uh, it's hard to imagine how that digital network will look like. Um, but yes, I think like we can just represent ourselves as like um, an, an icon or like a, an image of what our physical body looks like. Um, I guess in a, uh, just a quick extension to that point, um, what do you think the extent or the nature of the conscious lived experience would be for an uploaded mind? Since, you know, the human conscious or the human experience involves a lot of the sensory information that you receive on a day to day and the way that you interact with that. Um, in, in When your mind is uploaded, what kind of lived experience would be had would it be hyper simulated to be like in real life or just like as a human being, but just in a simulated environment or would it look very different from what it would normally look like? Um, yeah, so I, I'm not sure what you mean by like consciousness. Do you mean like perception and like sensation? Like when, when you touch my hand, like I, I feel that kind of touch being interpreted to in, in my brain? Or just like the, the scope of what living would be like for a mind uploaded individual in which like would you have a perception of body like would the would the understanding of body in this simulated world be important or uh, yeah yeah i i think definitely definitely we will have a sense of where our body is in space because Technically, we are transferring everything, absolutely everything in our brain to um, a digital network. And a part of um, our brain, um, I, I think it's called the somatosensory um, cortex. Um, it helps us identify the location of where we are in space. So I imagine that that part of the cortex, that function of that cortex will also be transferred, somehow digitized. Um, into like number zero and one uh, and to be imported to the network. And also about sensation, I think um, I made my point that one, one of the uh, function of mind uploading would be to help people who have like physical injuries to regain their motor and sensory functions. That is, um, that is to assume that mind uploading will help us um, maintain um, our sensory if that is not damaged and to help people who has damaged sensory and motor function to regain those. I, I don't know if that <laughs> answers your question. Yeah, it was, it was pretty open-ended, so that's, that, that's good. <laughs> you know, I think when we talk about mind uploading, we might want to even think about it as body uploading because, you know, the mind is, is very like, I don't even know if you could have it completely detached from the body or detached from the environment. Uh, I think the trouble with mind uploading is that you'd have to, you know, a reason why it might come a lot later than we'd like it to is that you need to have sufficient, you know, scanning and, and uh, um, like projection capabilities, not just for the mind, but for a whole simulated environment or a whole simulated body. You know, it goes much farther than just uh, emulating a consciousness because I think uh, you know everything's very interconnected and you know, we heard um, you know even quantum phenomena and the brain's microtubules might be part of understanding consciousness so uh, lots of new research on this is coming out and it might be a lot more uh, complex than we imagine um, and another thing which I, I I don't think you mentioned this but this is very interesting is that in uh, 2019, Nature published a paper that demonstrated that scientists were able to map the complete neural networks of nematode worms. Uh, so, you know, they had it all scanned up, 
uh, but they weren't able to emulate it. And I, I don't, you know, know everything about this study, uh, but, uh, you know, obviously there might be more just um, beyond uh, the brain. Um, yes, yes, I, I, I agree with you. Um, when I talk about um, mind uploading, uh, I don't mean just like the brain only, because we know that the nervous system is composed of um, the brain and the spinal cord, and it is the spinal cord that helps us, um, and, and the per peripheral nervous system that helps uh, send all of the sensation to our brain so that we can understand and perceive it. Um, and yeah, so basically what I mean is it's not just uploading the brain, it's uploading every like sensory component, uh, which the spinal cord is a part of the central nervous system and a part of the mind too. And also about scanning. Um, when I did the research on scanning, um, it, it was very clear to me that we have to assume that um, mind uploading is possible because we have the ability to scan everything, every molecule to the closest detail, because it's not just the growth structures of the brain that create our mind. It is the synapses or the neurotransmitter, their activities is what give us um, action potential. And uh, eventually I think is um, our thoughts and our emotions. Um, yeah, so, so I think um, I, I mentioned in uh, my presentation is that to scan to that level of detail will cost us much more data storage than we have on planet Earth. So Ray Kurzweil says that um, mind up uploading will be widespread and successful. Um, within the 2030s. So that, that is like in the next um, 19 years. Um, and I've argued that we are not going to be ready for it in the next 19 years. It doesn't mean that you, that you couldn't do it, but that no human would want to do it, that the, um, if there is a lot of it in 19 years, then the uh, psychiatry profession will benefit very much because those people are, are, are not going to be mentally normal and they're gonna be very unhappy and you know there'll be lots of problems. Um, if you wait, if you go 10 times longer like 192 years as opposed to 19 years, then I think maybe all these problems could be worked out and humans could figure out how to be happy in this new state. And it's true, you, you could do space travel, you could do a lot of things much easier as, as an electronic upload than as a biological body. But anyway, that's my argument. Um, and was first expressed in a video that had my seven-year-old granddaughter in it. And you, you can see what she thought about it too. And uh, the reason she was in it is that a lot of famous people do their, their, their most quotable statements, the age of, of uh, 29, you know, and, and uh, she would presumably, if everybody did mind, mind uploading in the 2030s, she would never reach that point. So she, there, there'd no, be no famous quotes from her because, you know, she, she wouldn't need to be speaking English. You could, you know, communicate directly with thoughts, presumably. So she'd skip that whole step of having famous quotations from the age of 29. So anyway, um, yeah, well, in, in the long run, it will be clear that either Kurzweil was right and Kim Solis was wrong or the other way around or somewhere in between, eh? So anyway. All right, well, I, I think that's the time for, for today. Thanks for the 
two of you very much. Uh, and uh, so next time we'll have three presenters. It looks like we'll never have more than three. And uh, depending on how, how things work out, maybe some occasions when, when they're fewer than three. But so you won't be all like a bunch of people all crammed up together or have to stay much, much longer than you planned for the class period. Um, yeah. OK, so we will see you on Thursday. And thanks very much for this session today. <laughs>